guys, what is going on? This is Brian Sumner. Welcome back to the Foolishness Podcast. I know it is crazy. There's so much going on. There seems to be so much darkness, but guys, there is also so much light. I'm excited to jump into this today. As you know, much of this is focused on life and the experiences, the ups and downs, but because of my past, so much of it is focused on skateboarding. And so it's with that that I say I'm bringing a good, good friend is someone that I looked up to, someone that really doesn't need any introduction at all. If you've ever touched a skateboard magazine, a skateboard video, even been to the mall in the, in the 2000s, you will have heard of this man. Um, he's a father, he's a husband, obviously, and he has just ran companies, started companies, been all over the world with a passion unlike that of which I've seen before. But more importantly, he wants to share some of the things on his heart. So. Mr. Jamie Thomas, how is it going, brother? <laughs> Hello, Brian. Um, you know, I think that that's a big question in these times. How's it going? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, um, I want to be empathetic to those that are struggling and that, you know, have lost their jobs or are finding hardship in the, you know, in the quarantine. But um, things are going really well with myself and the family and um, mm. I'm finding my groove and, um, and running the company in these times. And I'm just really trying to be um, patient and trusting and, and um, to be filled with gratitude. So, you know, I'd have to say things are going really well. Yeah. I know the other day when we were on the phone and, and you've checked in on some of the podcasts over the past few years and you're like, you know, honestly, I can almost feel bad because for so many, this is a crazy season. They've never had this much downtime. They've been go, 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 you know, just chasing the dollar perhaps, or suddenly life's upside down. But for you, it's been a life of go, go, go. Where the last year, really, you've said, I want to withdraw a little bit as far as just put the time where things matter. And so this season has been kind of like a, not that you've been void, but I mean, we're machines. We go, we've got to get a trick. We've got a video part. We set the deadline and that's kind of how we thrive. I can see it in your face. You know, if you know who Jamie Thomas is, this is kind of how it's been for us at these past decades. But this time of withdrawal is almost like it's refreshing, it's encouraging. And so, yeah. <laughs> you, you know, I, to, um, to expand on what you're saying, um, for the past almost two years, I've been transitioning into mm -hmm. um, really trying to identify and understand what my roles are at this phase of my life rather than what do I want them to be or what's comfortable for me. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I think that the quarantine for me personally couldn't have come at a better time because I've been really trying to focus on my priorities and focus on my responsibilities um, as a father and a leader, um, you know, in our small company and, um, and just a human and just trying to focus on how I can be the best version of myself and, you know, you have to slow down in order to invest in that change. And, you know, because you can be so caught up with, I have to do this, I have to do that. Mm -hmm. And it's really difficult to um, create change when you're just, you know, you, you feel like you don't have any choices, like everything, mm -hmm. you just have to do these things. And um, I've been, really been trying to slow down and take time to understand and realize what it is that I should be doing rather than thinking what it is that I have to be doing. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that perspective has really changed my life and transformed my life in lots of ways. And, um, it's really, uh, you know, obviously helped my relationships because now I'm investing in the relationships that really matter. Yeah. And, um, and my point, in, my point in all of this is, is to say that I've been practicing this for, you know, uh, a year and a half plus. Mm. And so when the quarantine came, it was like, it was like, oh, this is more of what I've been doing, but I'm, I'm even slowing things down even further and investing in more quality time with my wife and my children mm -hmm. um, and my coworkers. And, and it, it just felt like a blessing in order to be able to have that socially, because socially, usually a lot of other outside pressures are, mm -hmm. are, you know, are put upon us and expectations of us needing to be here or be there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've spent a good a good part of the last 20 years traveling and you know for the last few months mm -hmm. there's been absolutely no travel whatsoever and to be able to free my calendar like that and just focus on family and the things that matter and, yeah. and to not feel like I should be anywhere else or doing anything else yeah that, that is what I feel the blessing and that mm. you know is the blessing and I 
I'm very thankful for that. So, um, yeah, I mean, a, a lot of that is perspective, you know, it's my perspective of where I'm at at this phase in my life. And then to get the news of quarantine in this phase, you know, I, <laughs> I, I'm in a practice of surrendering to, you yeah. know, to what is most important. And, yeah. um, and I think that that is why I'm so thankful for the time, you know, that I've got to spend at home with the family. Yeah, even, you know, this would have been probably 10 years ago. You are such a machine. I know we're, we're made in God's image, but you're going, going, going. And even just saying, Brian, you know, I'm free. If I'm free that day and we can connect and we can do something, so be it. But sadly, a lot of people don't even get to be afforded these opportunities. And the guy that just is raised in a family where it's go, 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 they don't really hit 30, 35, 40, 45, and maybe stop and say, what's relevant? And for those who are listening, Jamie's making an amazing point, not just because a year and a half ago this opened up, but even today to say, guys, what if you are freaking out? What if you are losing your mind? I mean, what are the priorities? You know, is our marriage more important? Are our kids more important? Money will come and go. Location might come and go. I know you and I have seen our ups and downs. But so this has been this whole new season and refreshing. But before we even jump into that, I do want to say that you know, and, and this is going to be fun for you, just pulling back some of these memories. Some of those, we joked earlier, how many kids have been skating as long as we have? You know, that, you're a little bit older than me. But for me, the first time really seeing Jamie Thomas was, I'm this kid from Liverpool. I think I watched the Invisible video <laughs> with Laban and John Reeves and your good friend, Brian Young. And then Jamie was this guy that apparently, you know, was in San Francisco and Embarcadero and you were around Sean Young in that, right? And you even stayed on the streets some of those nights and you were rocking the simples and ripping and shredding. I'm now this amateur for birdhouse in America, you know, living with Reynolds and Greco and going back to Lakeland, Florida. This is his Jamie. He's like, who's this Jamie guy? He's skating to paint it black. And he's got this old school, amazing mute grab and Benny Hanna, but he makes it look raw and good. And man, this guy's got some, I can see this. And then suddenly I'm at Andrew's house watching these contests and there's like Andrew skating around. There's Jamie. And by the time we got back from Tampa, Welcome to Hell was coming out, a very famous Toy Machine video. And that for me and for many others, obviously rooming with Jim Greco at the time, seeing this part in skating, that was when you were about to be birthed into this whole new kingdom that's just kind of ran the last few decades. But seeing Welcome to Hell where there's a misfit shirt that they probably sold millions of shirts because of your video part. Iron Maiden, a band that I grew up on, and you're skating the Hello Be Thy Name, which I'm still to this day trying to play on a guitar, you know? But for me, I say that to those who might not understand skating. Skating is very much a religion in itself at the time where we're getting the same videos in the magazines. And so here's Jamie with this video part. I mean, I can see it in my mind. My, my son was doing backside lip sides the other day, and I took him in the house. And I could hear the beat, you know, the dun -dun -dun, and all the skaters are laughing right now because this is what skating is to us. I can bring up a Mike Carroll part. You know exactly what it was, what the song was. So you then, my memories are this guy that worked hard. Toy Machine came out. This video came out. And suddenly there was guys like yourself, you know, like Jeff Rowley, who I think is going to even come by later today. Guys like Muska that really hit the roof as far as you were able to birth companies. I mean, you and Steve Barra and Jeremy Ray got me on audio, you know. I think you even drew the audio logo perhaps, right? I think I was in your garage and you're like, oh yeah, this is the stencil and Mercury Trucks. I was a part of that. Thanks for putting me on. But there was so much beyond that where you were the guy, and I'm saying this to those who were listening for what was actually on Jamie Thomas's plate. You're putting a team together, putting a video together, putting music together. You're, you're gathering tours. You've got your wife, Joanne, and the kids. There's so much going on which brings in fame, accolades, covers, videos, magazines. And we know biblically, we throw that verse around so much. What does it benefit man if he gains the whole world? And we know it goes on to say, but he's losing his soul. But for you, in that time in skating, as it took off, what was it like going from a kid from what was it, Florida or even Alabama? To just, Alabama, yeah. To just, that was your life, you know, because you just took it by the reins and just went and you influenced so many. And there's so many people that, found bands or found music or did specific tricks because of where you were, you know, that influences. So just what was that like to help people understand, you know, that's a, well, I appreciate all the kind words you said about those things that I was involved in. Um, that's a big question. What was yeah. it like? Um, 
you know, so growing up in, I'll go back a little bit, growing yeah. up in Alabama, um, I discovered skateboarding around 11, 12 years old. I actually um, lived in Florida for a few years mm -hmm. and um, in the late 80s or mid, mid to late 80s, um, discovered skateboarding, then moved back to Alabama where I was, you know, uh, lived before the, the Florida stint. And um, when I discovered skateboarding, I, um, I really, really loved that you could learn at your own pace and that you could learn however you want. There mm. It wasn't like, it wasn't like um, conventional sports where you had to do it this one way or it was wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, like if you go and watch someone bat or swing a golf club or tennis, <laughs> there's all this form, which, you know, there is, there is in skateboarding too. Like if your kickflip goes a certain way, it's considered like better, you know, mob, having mob. yeah mob or flick, but, <laughs> but, it, but really skateboarding was so, um, Mm -hmm. it was so unique in that it was whatever you made it and I really took to it and mm. and I really liked being able to push myself at my own pace without being compared per se you know in the early years to anyone yeah. else or to anything else and to just really enjoy it and I also had a lot of energy and and then later on I realized I had a lot to prove you know um I've spoken about this in other in other interviews and stuff, but I, I really wanted um, my father's approval, and I wanted to show that you know I had something to offer and that I had value, and um, you know, and because I chose skateboarding, and my father never really understood it or took the time to understand skateboarding, um, you know, that there was a big disconnect there. And it was kind of like the more I invested in skateboarding, the further away, our, the further apart our relationship grew. You because see that. yeah, be, yeah, because he he just outwardly didn't understand it. He didn't understand. It just seemed like a waste of time. Yeah, you know. And um, but my passion and my connection to skateboarding was was like growing, and it was evolving, and it and it was like I was evolving as a human in that mm -hmm. relationship. And what I was really learning was I was learning how to fail and overcome failure on a mm -hmm. daily basis, like hundreds and hundreds of times a day. <laughs> and, and to learn how to process that and deal with that. And I think that that's why skateboarders are so resilient because if you want to learn how to skateboard, it's not easy. Yeah. Nothing about it is easy. Yeah. You know, when you, you, when you go to the skate park and you see a bunch of kids on scooters, you know why they're on scooters because it's way <laughs> easier than skateboarding. It's and the way parents easier. don't love them. Yeah. <laughs> no, <I'm kidding. laughs> it's way, no, it's way easier to get started. It's way easier to get good, you know, yeah. and, and, and inline or rollerblading was the same way, but skateboarding mm. is hard. Yeah. And, and there's, there's a certain level of commitment, conviction, determination. Yeah. And I, I felt like I was evolving and growing as a person, the more I did it. Mm -hmm. And I was feeling the self-esteem. I mean, I, I got an, an immense amount of self-esteem from skateboarding and devoting myself to it. And yeah. the more, the more time and energy I put into it, the more I got the feel, better feelings I got and the, the cooler it felt. And the mm. culture of skateboarding was so cool too. And it was so diverse. <laughs> you got guys from like Christian Hosoi, Neil Blender, Tony Hawk, Nottis, Gons. You got yeah. all these crazies really like crazy, yeah. cool creative people all over these spectrums and the magazines were just filled with them yeah and like every page was like these yeah. amazing and they're unique, genius in their own yeah, right. yeah 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 they're all they're all savants and they're, yep. they're, they're geniuses in their own right and i just remember being a kid and just being completely enamored and like wow. and, you know <laughs> uh you know just so into the skateboarding and all the different aspects of it and then and then i could replicate that with my friends in my neighborhood and I could build a yeah. little mini ramp or a launch ramp and we would we would recreate scenes from like Animal Chin and from the videos <laughs> that we saw wow. and and we would try and learn the tricks and and we didn't know anything except watch them over and over and over and watch where they put their hand watch where they kick their foot we yeah. would go do it and then we would film it on like my buddy's VHS camera <laughs> and then we would try and compare to see how we were doing you know yeah. and, and um that that was it. That was really it for me. Discovering skateboarding, discovering mm -hmm. the community, the friendship, the creativity, um, yeah. and discovering how to really like very, very simply push myself as a human, like yeah. push my, push my boundaries and continue to keep dreaming and being curious. Yeah. And, and, and all of that 
development really came into kind of where the rubber meets the road is when I got to California and I really started to identify what I had to offer the skateboard community. Mm-hmm. I mean, cause as a kid in Alabama, I was dreaming, like, I want I want to be there. I want to be a part of that. I think, hmm. I think I have something to offer and I didn't even know what I had to offer. Right. Yeah. I, you know, it wasn't clear. I couldn't have told you if I'd have done an, an interview for the newspaper or something, I wouldn't have been newspaper able to, back then. Yeah. yeah. I wouldn't have known what to tell yeah. someone, but I do know that like I had a burning desire yeah. to get to California and to make a life in skateboarding. Yep. That was like, that was so, so clear from about 15, 16. And for those few years in Alabama in high school, I was just buying time. I was just waiting till I was old enough for it to be socially acceptable for me to leave my life behind and go start a new life in California. And, <laughs> and I worked at Burger King and saved up and bought, bought a car wow. from uh, my aunt and uncle. And then I worked telemarketing to save up money to move to California. Um, even though I didn't really have enough money because my car broke down right before we left me, Sean Young and Hurley, my car broke <laughs> down, the timing belt blew and we all chipped in to get my car fixed. And then we had this date we were going to leave. And even though we didn't, we weren't able to have the money that we really wanted. We just left anyway. And we all had, I think about $300 each. And, wow. and we spent about 300 or 400 getting across the country. Um, from and, Alabama to San Francisco. Yeah, we actually left from Atlanta at the time. But yeah, two, two, actually, we went to San Diego first and, hooked and, and like linked up with Mirko Mangum. And then wow. we stayed there for a week or so in San Diego. And then we went up to San Francisco. And then I stayed in San Francisco for a year and a half. Um, but at that time, we didn't have enough money to get a place or an apartment or anything. And we, and, you know, and I was on flow for, for Deluxe or Real at the time. Mm-hmm. And so they were giving me boards. But you know, they were, you know, looking at, looking back at it from their perspective, they were probably hoping I stayed in Alabama and I would just be a flow kid that helped them out regionally, help their sales. If I was noticed you locally. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And they probably hoped or didn't even really think about it that this kid doesn't show up at our doorstep and is asking to be on our team. But this family all broken. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's actually exactly what I did. I showed up at Real's doorstep and was like, Hey, hey, can I, can I be down with you guys? And, um, and I didn't have the etiquette, you know, I didn't, I didn't have, I didn't have really anything worked out. I was Mm -hmm. very, very rough. Um, and I didn't have the social skills. I I had a small town etiquette, you know, I didn't, I didn't know how to integrate into this clique in California. Mm -hmm. So it, it was difficult. And, um, they didn't really have a lot to offer me, which is understandable. And um, so me and my, my friends, uh, Sean and Hurley, we just sl- slept on the streets for a while. Um, we both got pretty sick. And, um, and Hurley went home after about a month wow. or a month and a half. Um, yeah, I got, you know, I, I talked about this in another interview recently, actually, but I got staph infection and strep throat back to back. And, um, you know, had really, a really high fever and was sleeping outside. And, um, and this is about September, October, mm-hmm. November, and even into December, we were on the streets um, in San Francisco, and it's pretty cold during that period. So, you know, it, there was there was some rough times, and I considered going home, um, but you know, my, I, I would communicate with my mom. I'd talk to her once a week and tell her how I was doing. And um, wow, my birthday was in October, and um, she asked what I wanted for my birthday, and I asked for a sleeping bag because I went out there and I just had a blanket. So I was like sleeping on the concrete with a blanket and that seems pretty <laughs> insane to me now. But um, wow. at any rate, she sent me an amazing sleeping bag and a big care package of food and stuff. And I, I was just so thankful that she loved me and was supporting me. Like, mm. you know, to send your 17 year old son or, you know, 18 at the time uh, at my birthday um, to send him a sleeping bag and food because he's choosing to sleep on the streets of San Francisco yeah, that's a big show of support and love. Like, you know, I, I would probably want to go rescue my son. But, yeah, you know, she had, of course, faith. she <laughs> had faith. Year old still yeah. home and I don't want yeah. to move across the world. Totally. So <laughs> she had faith and, you know, and it was probably hard for her to know that I was on the streets and, and struggling, but hmm. um, that I had to find my own way. And I think she knew that. And, um, you know, I talked about this in, a, in an old interview, but you know, um, I got into a, you know, a really big argument and almost a physical confrontation with my father. And I was about 13, 14 years old at the time. 
Yeah. And I remember going back to my room and like trying to like pack my stuff, you know, like I was going to, I was going to run away from home. And, um, my mom came to my room and my room was a mess too. I I imagine if my kids had the room I had, it was like spray paint writing all (laughs) over the walls. Like it was really like, I wanted to live in like a skateboard movie like you know if you saw a skateboard movie gleaming and the guys the cube yeah yeah gleaming, gleaming the cube in the like cellar or whatever christian slate of the yeah, cell christian. one <laughs> yeah yeah the you know the guy has the little half pipe room or whatever yeah anyway max herlock yeah, yeah 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 so i um i wanted to have that like punk rock room and i did my mom and just let me have it but my mom came into my room and said to me um I said, I'm running away. I can make it on my own. You know, I don't need this. I don't need you guys. Hmm. And my mom, I remember my mom sat on the end of my bed and she said to me, um, I said, I can make it on my own mom. And she said, I know you can, I know you can make it on your own son, but I know the the world will be a whole lot more ready for you when you're 18. Wow. And, um, that's some wisdom right there from mom. That's amazing. Jamie. <laughs> yeah. Wow. And it was, it was Thank amazing. You, mm. It was amazing how she validated me but then let me know that hmm. the world wasn't ready for me. It wasn't that I wasn't ready for the world. Yeah. And, um, and that, that's the type of love and support that she gave me through, you know, has given me hmm. throughout my life. Well, guys, just leave and listen to Jamie. I mean, we'll unpack some more of this. Thank you for being so open, but it's true about skating. You know, if we go play baseball, you're squashing the bug, you hit the ball a certain way. Yes, there's variations, but skating is Jamie Thomas watching Mark Gonzalez or Natus going down to his driveway trying to do those tricks and failing or not. So if you said to me, Brian, let's go on a trip right now. I have this plan. I don't really have to ask you what it is. You have a PhD in life. You've faced so many challenges you've overcame. And I know we'll probably go into it in a bit, but even the idea of a father, you know, and my, my son played baseball. I mean, I'm English. I don't even know what a baseball does. And that was an opportunity for me at the time as a believer to say, man, I would want him to go skate with me all day. He wasn't as interested then but this is his avenue of choice. And back then in Alabama, I I don't doubt, you know, was dad really aware of what he was doing or thinking or whatever else, you know, but, but you took that drive and that led you to say, I'm going to go and accomplish something. And I get that. I get how we can even shut our kids out, shut ourselves out that disconnect. And so you now then make it across to California. You're there, you're riding for simple. I'm seeing these simple images in my mind. I'm seeing you all in the guns gap and Benny Harness and stuff like that. But then it suddenly again goes even bigger at this stage. How does your mom or even your dad react to Jamie with video parts, Jamie with paychecks coming in? How did that play out, you know? Well, I don't think that they were really that aware, you know. And to be honest, I didn't really have that close of a relationship because Mm -hmm. we grew, you know, really apart in my adolescence and teen years. And even though I lived in the same house, we kind of avoided each other and we weren't very close and we didn't have... Mm. A, um, we didn't have a rhythm of communication. So, you know, I really didn't speak to my father that much for years. Um, mm-hmm. I would check in with my mom and that was because of her love and support through those tough times. I felt a connection with her yeah. and, um, and I felt like she was in my corner. And so I continued to um, keep in touch with my mom and, mm. and, um, and let her kind of know, you know, things that were opening up for me and, you know, tell her about, you know, how my life was going. But to be honest, I, I didn't really brag about it and I didn't feel close enough to my dad to share it, even though I wanted, yeah. I wanted him to care and I wanted to prove to him. Yeah. Um, but at this point I was kind of just navigating life and trying to figure it out on my own. Mm-hmm. And, um, it, the first time that my parents acknowledged that, you know, my, my dad hadn't given me any money since I'd been in California, I'd been there for yeah. years. Um, you know, and my mom helped me a little bit in the beginning, but for mm-hmm. the most part, I was completely on my own and not asking for any, any help from them. And, um, when I got on toy machine, I bought my first vehicle and, um, Todd Swank, the owner of Tomietto and, um, really the guy who financially supported me, like, you know, Ed, mm-hmm. Ed called me and asked me to ride for toy machine, which was amazing and such a blessing and a, an amazing opportunity. Um, but you know, Ed wasn't the business guy, you know, I had to go meet with, I had to go meet with Todd, you know, and Todd asked me, you know, how much money I wanted and if it was going to, you know, what I was looking for. And I told him that I wanted a place to, you know, um, (laughs) 
I wanted a place to belong. I wanted to be able to help make things yeah. happen and, and film videos and make cool stuff. And, mm. you know, he got completely, you know, behind me in, in all ways. And, and um, even to the point where I went to go buy a, an, an Isuzu rodeo. I don't know why I was so loyal to Isuzu, but I, I had a, the Isuzus, yeah. Yeah. I had an Isuzu I mark when I drove, <laughs> when I drove to California and then my first car that I bought new was an Isuzu rodeo. And I think it was probably 97 or six. Was it silver though? Cause that was, no, cool. no, I had a silver one, but that was during misled youth days. Um, but That's what I remember, yeah, but I had a black one first and, um, it was actually 95. It was a 95 Isuzu Rodeo. Because I remember taking it on a trip, a toy machine or a Tomietto tour the year before Welcome to Hell came out. At wow. any rate, I bought a 95 Isuzu Rodeo and my wife and I were, you know, um, we were dating at the time and we took a road trip back to see my parents and I drove the rodeo um, back there. And, you know, I showed up with this new car that my father didn't have any you know, hand yeah. in. And, and t the reason I brought up Todd is that yeah. Todd's, Todd Swank co-signed for me. Yeah. Um, so I didn't have enough credit in order to buy it on my own. I'd never had a credit card. So that year I bought us, I got a secured credit card with $500 balance or limit. And then <laughs> I got a, I got an Isuzu rodeo and, and Todd co-signed for me. And, um, and so I showed up wow. at home. I showed up at home with my own car. I'd been paying taxes on my own mm. and I'd been supporting myself. And, um, and my father, my father said to me, Hey son, I, I want you to know that I'm proud of you. You know, you're doing it on your own and, and I'm, I'm proud of, mm. I'm proud of you. And honestly, Brian it is, it was the first time wow. I'd ever heard that in my life. And so I didn't know how to receive it. I, I just said, Hey, I think dinner's ready. You know, like I said wow. something to like change the subject and get out of the room. When that was all you were waiting to hear. Yeah, it was all I was waiting to hear, but it caught me wow. so off guard because I just never imagined actually hearing it. Wow. And, um, you know, and it took a while for that to sink in and really matter. And I think that every time I went home for probably 10 more years, mm. I felt that I needed to prove to my dad that, you know, I was worthy of his praise and his love. And, and it was, um, and, that, and that's been something that, Mm. has taken you know until recently for me to really really invest in that relationship and um, it took me getting to a point of you know f forgiveness and, and making an intentional wow an, an intentional um, uh, point or mission to understand um, the dynamics of our relationship and that's kind of like a midlife thing where I'm really reflecting yeah. on you know, what, what makes me who I am and, and what are all the things that contribute to that? And then trying to find, find the elements of, of my, of my personality and myself that I'm still, I'm still doing that, that no longer serve me and having, yeah, yeah. having, having this level of feeling like I need to prove myself to my father or to others is no longer serving me. And, yeah, but even to yourself at times, for, for I sure. need to know who I think I am. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, so, and the reason I bring that up is, is that, you know, I, there's this book um, that's called Parenting from the Inside Out. And it's really, the premise of the book is about under, that we can't really parent children in the best possible way until we can mm -hmm. make sense of our own childhood. Yeah. And so I really needed to make sense of my own childhood. And, and by making sense of it, I needed to go back and understand my parents' childhood and ask them questions and be curious about what yeah. their lives were like before they had children. So then I can understand why they parented us the way they did. And, and once I conditioned the way they were. And yeah, exactly. I might have never had someone tell him, I'm proud of you. Yeah. It for years. And, and Jamie, you know this, that, you know, and I said this on prior podcasts, but we look at our sons as men, you know, so if, if someone comes over the door, starts attacking me and Jamie Thomas is with me, you better stop the guy from attacking me as well. Cause we're the men. So we yeah. look to our sons as men, but our wives look to them as like they're little boys. We yeah. look to our daughters, our little princesses. So when your dad sees you from the age of 13 to whatever, he's thinking, how's he going to survive? What's he going to do? What kind of man is he going to be? And so his direction Sadly, because of the world we're living in, I mean, the Bible says you'll work hard by the sweat of your brow. He's thinking, make money, figure out what you're doing. Here's whatever. And a lot of times dads don't realize that the way they interact with that doesn't come across as loving. So for him to say, well, look at my boy, look what he's doing. 
And then again, I'm going back to Alabama back then. I mean, middle of America, you know, you're talking 100 years ago through to what, the 50s, 60s, 70s, how they were raised. It was just tilling the ground, being the farmer, working hard, doing what the man said in the house. Yes, Pop. Yeah. That's, it's not like you and me talking on a podcast with thousands of people listening about how to parent or quoting books, you know, that you're reading. So, yeah. so as you went back to that journey, though, what did you find for them? Uh, wow. It, it was so enlightening. You know, wow. I, I learned that my father, you know, really mm -hmm. what was missing was, um, was the ability for attachment and mm -hmm. the ability for connection. Um, I learned that my father's childhood, that when he was very young, he tested really, really high on some aptitude tests um, for engineering and, and um, mathematics. Yeah. So I think around fifth or sixth grade, he got like taken out of the school with all the neighborhood friends and all the people that he knew. And he got bused across town or like an hour away to go mm. to this special school and it was an opportunity for him to learn. And he, he probably did foster, um, you know, his, his level of intelligence. It was kind of like, uh, not, not a gifted school, but just like a school that was, that was cut out for, um, yeah. something that he tested for. And in that process, it removed him from his friends. It removed him from his family. And he spent, yeah. he, it was basically like he was going to college in, in late elementary, early junior high, and he had such a separation from his parents mm -hmm. and he felt this like this massive void in his life of, of relationship and attachment. Mm -hmm. And his mother, his mother and his grandmother, you know, he shared with me, you know, very, very rarely hugged him and showed affection to him. And so the, mm -hmm. the, the crazy, the crazy process is, is that I didn't learn this until a year or two ago, you know, or a year and a half ago. Wow, Jamie. Yeah. I learned, I learned that my father wasn't raised with love and affection. He was raised with, mm. this is what you're supposed to do. This mm. is what you have to do. If you live by these rules, life will be safe and life will be okay. Mm. And, you know, and when I learned to understand that I had so much empathy and so much uh, understanding that I never had had before. And, and yeah. it really took me, being curious about his life. And I, I, I interviewed him with my iPhone. I was going to say we should have yeah. had him on as well. But no, yeah. I mean, I, I interviewed him with my iPhone and that was like, that was like step one of this, like breaking down these barriers in our relationship. Hmm. And then the crazy thing was, is since I asked him about all those things and since I cared and I showed, wow. and, and I showed curiosity about his life and who he really was, he, I could, I could see, I could see barriers coming down in him as well. Yeah. The like flow was, just came out. Like, yeah. This and is... then, and then from there, wow. we were, we were able to reestablish like in the middle of my life and near the, you know, yeah. latter years of his life, we were mm. able to, to recreate a foundation for a relationship that now we've been building on. Wow. And, and as every time I see him or every time I talk to him, I've been trying to, you know, not force it, but expand on that, on those discoveries and on that, wow. that foundation. And, you know, and there was times where he told me just how challenging I was as a child. He's like, he's like, you know, your, your will and your desire to do what it is that you thought you had to do or you wanted to do was so strong that mm -hmm. you overpowered me like in third, fourth grade. Yeah. And I didn't know how to deal with that in his own home. And then yeah, his mom's yeah. not siding with you, but that's often what happens. Yeah. Yeah. And so he's like, I, I tried to, <laughs> you know, forcefully, forcefully, you know, show you that I was in charge, mm. but it seemed like that didn't matter anyway. Nothing would stop you. Mm. And I really had never had that perspective of how strong my will was or my desire. Mm. And, and, and I, I said to him, and I'm thankful that I did. And, and he said, so I just surrendered and gave up. And I just, I tried to, you know, just find a way to coexist with you, but I didn't feel like there was room for me in your life. Hmm. And, and I said to him, I said, but dad, I needed you to fight for me. I hmm. needed you to be there for me and to not give up on me. And, and what you're telling me is, is that you gave up because I was too challenging, but like I needed hmm. you. And, and I, you know, and, um, he, he, he felt it and he heard it and he said, you know, I'm sorry, son, I wish I could have been there for you. you wow. know? And, and as I, as I understood, 
his life and what and how he was brought up, I realized that 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 level of attachment and connection and his ability to hug and love me and tell me mm. that he loved me and that he was he was proud of me on a daily basis that was very difficult it wasn't it wasn't the way he was raised and yeah, that was foreign to him to say yeah. here's my son from yeah. california with his wife i'm proud of you i mean my dad will say that a lot now you know but i think when i started skating and i, and I definitely want to go back to this story this is amazing but you know how could jamie go across country well i came to america when i was 15 or 16 you said well what kind of parents did he have like i said the skating family were all together Growing up, you know, around Jeff Rowley, coming over here, ride for flip for a bit, living with those guys. Why would I be living here at 15, 16? Because this drive is pulling us. But what you're saying is so true is that there's a very famous um, preacher lady, you know, on television, Joyce Meyer, and she had had crazy things happen to her through her dad. I mean, she was literally raped her whole life by him. And years later when she was married, it's a sad, sad story, but that's her own dad doing this over 200 times. I mean, it's crazy but she went back with her own husband to just say, I forgive you. And he just broke and open. And I'm not proving any of this at all. You know, don't get me wrong, but he literally explained what had happened in his life through an uncle and this cycle. And it goes on and it goes on. So I'm just amazed to hear that you got to sit with your dad. And, and he said, son, because to those listening, here's what happens as a parent, as we try and say something to our son or our daughter, if the wife doesn't come alongside an agreement and there's a struggle, a lot of times men win, will default because either I raise my voice, I shout, I say, I'm the, the man of the house. You know what I mean? I'll die for this family. I'm going to go provide, make money for this family. But sometimes in love is the wife's going, well, son, this, that. The son's voice, especially as he hits puberty, he's rebellious, he's rowdy. The dad and the son get into it. That's a crazy season. I mean, I have a 19-year-old, praise God for how he is. But it could easily go that way, you know, at times and there's frustration. And so being a stronger character, as I know we are anyway, skateboarders, did that give you, and I want to make a point about this, did that give you closure? Because for a man, you, know, you get into it in your car with someone, you just want closure. Someone says something rude to someone, you need to call them closure. Did you get the closure from dad in that season just for, for Jamie Thomas, you know, for your life? You know, um, I didn't get immediate closure, but as I processed our conversation and as I kind of kept replaying it back, and then mm. as I started investing in, in my father and I's relationship, and you know, and a lot of this was inspired by my sister. My, I have, um, I'm the youngest of four, and the sister right above me, we grew up together in the house, and it was almost like there were two sets of kids. The mm. older two were moving out by the time I knew what was going on, you know? Um, and I grew up with my um, sister above me. Her name is Sue. And, um, and, you know, in midlife, we've been able to really connect and share stories and be there to love and support each other through um, the struggles and the challenges we face. Amen. And, um, and she, she had already experienced this process with our father. Um, and she was basically telling me that, if you open your mind to the possibility of a relationship with, with dad or with, you know, pop, um, mm. you know, it's possible, it's possible for you to have. And, and I think that that, cause it was something I was struggling with, you know, and it was something that was like, I was fighting and wrestling with for most of my life. It was this mm. disconnect from my, from my earthly father, you know, mm -hmm. and, and ironically, this is very similar to the disconnect with our heavenly father and, and being able to trust and, and love and connect. Mm -hmm. And, and I, um, you know, she, she really told me how her relationship changed and it changed when she started investing in that relationship. Mm -hmm. And so I realized that my wife and I were parenting our children in a way. And, you know, more specifically, I was, I was repeating the cycle, you know, I was, I was there more and I was, you know, trying to hug my kids and, and be there for my kids more, but I wasn't totally vested in their lives. I wasn't yeah. like, what can I do to love, encourage, and support you? Mm. You know, I was like thinking in my mind, this is what you're supposed to do. I'll do that. And then <laughs> I'll still want to do, I'll still want to go skate and make video parts and be on social media and do mm -hmm. this other stuff on the side in order to fulfill me. Yeah. It, it, I wasn't at the time, you know, a few years ago, I wasn't aware that I could find fulfillment 
in my relationship with my children, with my mom, my mother, my father, my siblings, my friends, and, and, and my relationship mm. with the Lord. I wasn't, I wasn't aware that I could find everything I needed in, those, in that connection. And as I started to invest in this relationship with my father, I really started understanding mm. how precious and how valuable it was. And, and so, you know, back <laughs> to your question, yeah. I started unpacking you know, um, this over several conversations with he and I, and then when I would go home to visit, there would be a desire to spend time and talk and connect and, mm -hmm. and to share with each other how we're doing. And, and we do that on the phone. I talked to him like, uh, day before yesterday, wow. you know, and he, he wants to catch me up on what's going on, you know, at, you know, with my mom and what's going on with, you know, with things that are, you know, in his world. But I really have to, you know, ask him like, pop, but how are you doing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, how, how are you? And, yeah. and taking him and investing in him in that way, it, it lets him, you know, lower his guard and really show yeah. up for me, not just as a parent, it makes it, it helps him show up for me as, you know, in a loving relationship. And I think mm -hmm. that that is something that I've been practicing. And, and, you know, and it, it, re it reaps, you know, great rewards because I'm able wow. to feel this connection with him that I've never <laughs> felt before. And, you know, you made the point, I was thinking it, of course, the whole time. I mean, this is, you look around, the Bible says the universe declares his majesty. It's beautiful. We see his creation. It's set up that way. We're made in his image. But also Romans says that all of creation cries out for the revealing of the sons of God. That means we have to work hard. There's pain in childbirth. We struggle with our family, with our siblings, with our, our own children, you know. But it's really true that when you look around, we all need ultimately that return to our Heavenly Father. And sadly, they're saying that 80% of the issues with men in our country is because of a distant relationship with their father. They're saying 80% yeah. again, the same number in prison. It's because they didn't even know their father. So regardless where people listen, where they are with their faith, you know, whether, whether they believe what we believe or not, but that we are made in God's image. And, and for me to have that relationship with my heavenly father, I mean, my dad's own dad was the same way. You know, he was the youngest and he would say, and he's a quiet man, you know, but he's a diligent hard work. And he would say, you know, my dad never really said much to me. He would just kind of affirm my older brother, but then I think he was older on. So my dad in his way made the effort and did what he did. They very much affirmed skating. And so now, you know, as he's in his eighties and he can't fly right now, he's got diabetes. Am I even going to see him again? amidst this whole corona thing so we make that effort to talk and whether it's making fun of things sometimes or doing whatever but just like you're saying my dad just needs to know he's being seen by us you know yeah. where my wife's mother she lives they live six doors down on the other side of the street here in huntington beach and she has this whole thing going on with her body kind of shutting down her legs her arms so for my wife though we see them all the time she's making all this raw vegan you know stuff that i know you are very familiar with taking it down there twice a day, sitting with her mom, because that's really it. And guys, for those listening, mom is just tongues for mom with the U and the M. But, <laughs> but it's so true. And I mean, I don't know if you realize what you're really saying for people, but how many of us are just only thinking about skating, which is a great thing. And, and Jamie's not saying don't have a career and don't enjoy this stuff. Don't do all that. Because in a way, you were far, I'm sure you fathered many people they're on tour with you. They're going through stuff with girlfriends, with money, with drugs, with anger, depression. So I'm sure you've parented a lot of them. But yes, yeah, stopping and trusting, Lord, children are a gift from you. You've given me these kids to be a blessing, but also grow me. I know yeah. we talked about how we can feel like, really, I, I just said that, or I didn't make it to this that day, or I was more preoccupied. We're all going to have regrets. That's a part of life. But, but what a thing to hear in this season. So so your dad's still alive. Your parents are still going, yeah? Yeah, th yeah, they are. And I just spoke to my father a few days ago. And yeah. our, our relationship continues to get better and better. And there's, there's one thing that, I, you know, I thought about, um, mm. you know, while you were talking. And, and um, you know, and I'll share this. Um, yeah. A few years ago, um, you know, my wife and I have been married for 23 years. Um, mm. Most of my skateboarding career, um, we've been together and she's been you know, with me through the ups and downs of, mm. of skateboarding, business, injuries, everything. And, um, and, you know, she's for the most part been, been, you know, married to a very determined, strong willed man who's been obsessed with all of this madness, mm. like video parts and business and, 
you know, I, I've struggled with obsessive, you know, addictive behavior for most of my life. And, mm. you know, and, and that is seen on the outside as drive. You know, people see that as like a drive, a it drive for perfection. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it is celebrated socially, you know, mm -hmm. like my video parts, they're, they're celebrated by people because they think that, I mean, they influence them in some positive, in some positive way. And, and while they're positive to most of the world, you know, I, I don't have a choice. Like yeah. I felt like I felt like I had an affliction that I had to create and push myself this far yeah. or my, or my value was diminished. And, and mm. you know, th this helped create, it was like I was basing my self worth based on what I produced, yeah, you, were you know, and your own kingdom and you were the, king. yeah, yeah, for sure. And, you know, and I, I think that while most people would be like, Oh, thanks for doing that. You know, I was suffering because no amount of accolades mm. or no amount of accomplishment was yeah. filling the void inside me. You know, that void was just continuous. And I, you know, I got depressed after every video that I, every mm. video part I ever made and every video I ever made because I expected, I had unrealistic expectations for reaching the finish line. Yeah, yeah. There's two things that happen. One is, is that I really just enjoy the process. I don't even care if it ever gets finished. <laughs> and the second, the second thing is, the second thing is, is that I did, I had unrealistic expectations that I would, that, that this would change and it would fill this void I had inside me, mm -hmm. you know, and even though I became a believer in 99 and, you know, you'll probably, we'll probably go back and talk about how that happened, but yeah. you know, it's been over 20 years, but even though I believed I was still practicing what I knew, I was still going down the path of least resistance. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I was still doing and trying to find fulfillment mm. in, in, in my works. I was trying mm -hmm. to find fulfillment in what I was creating. And, um, you know, and that, that led to all different types of addiction, you know, workaholism, um, you know, yep. addicted to, to, you know, uh, acknowledgement addicted to you know people yeah you know whatever praise addicted to power you know and and um and it's not know, always I, defined I, like that people don't know it's not it's not don't it, realize you know, it yeah you know but i i identify it as addiction you know I, I heard this podcast on you know addictive behavior and and addiction is uh, is defied at it at its at it the most simple way is not being okay with the moment you're in Mm -hmm. and wishing it were different <laughs> by adding x yeah you know and and i would not be okay with just sitting still you know and people say i have to keep moving but the reason i have to keep moving is because i'm not okay with this moment i'm not yeah. okay with who i am you've got to flee from it just sitting here i need to go do something that defines mm. me wow you no know? and and i spent decades trying to do things that I felt defined me and that, that were really attached to my identity mm. as a skateboarder that went all the way back to childhood. And skateboarding, skateboarding was the thing, the constant throughout adolescence, throughout all the struggles, throughout living on the street, throughout making a life for myself, throughout providing for my wife and kids. It was the constant for three decades yeah. in my life. So it was the thing that I identified most with on this earth but it was no longer serving me. It wasn't helping me with my relationship with my wife. And in, in the opposite, it was hindering me because mm -hmm. I was stuck in extended adolescence and I was stuck in, you know, with Peter Pan syndrome. Yeah. And, and I was just chasing the same thing I was chasing when I was 20, when I was 25, when I was 30, mm. when I was 35. Now I'm, you know, entering midlife and I'm still just chasing the same thing trying to get a video for instagram so people will like it so yeah. it'll be like my modern video part that i filmed today and it's everyone will be like now at yeah, yeah yeah and every everyone will be like oh you know you know they'll they'll connect who i was and what i did in the past with what i did today and think that i'm still relevant and i that will make <laughs> me feel better you mm -hmm. know but you know you and i have discussed and you know mm -hmm. it's it's clear that that is cotton candy that yeah. is cotton candy. That's it's not fleeting. It's like the wind. And, and, totally. and I want to ask you this, and I want you to continue on, but so you're saying, because for me, I was like, here's this Tom Benny guy. Here's this Jeff Roldy guy growing up in Liverpool. Man, I would love to get free board. You know, and we all love the same thing. We love getting stickers and putting them on the board and just the fun of putting rails on. And I grew up thinking like you, I'd love to be in California with the red curbs and all the spots. So to me to get to go be invited to be in the end video, you know, where then there was the audio thing and, even the Baker 2G and the rest of it, 
I loved being there, but I guess the end goal for me was I just want to be in America. I just want to enjoy the sun, you know, when I'm here in Huntington Beach. But, but you're saying even for you, the journey to a video part to whatever, it wasn't just that Zero would then go on to sell, you know, however many dollars worth of boards, or you would give birth to other people's careers, or you could help them. It's great to be at a premiere. I know how many stories. We don't need to go there today, but we could easily sit on, on movie premieres and the madness. But you're just saying it really literally came down to you knew you were just trying to fill this void. It was like a better video part, a better thing. And this whole idea that legends never die. I mean, guys, they all die. Legends all die. We don't even know the legends of past unless they're recorded. You know what I mean? But, but you were saying, was it this void inside that you're like, I knew I was trying to fill it? Or did you want the fame, the accolades, all of it, the power, the, the kingdom of Jamie, really? You know, I just wanted to be distracted from the pain that I mm. felt. That's as simple as it is. I wow. wanted to be distracted that the, from the pain that I felt and the disconnection. Wow. I had a disconnection with my father. That's where it started. Yeah. I had a disconnection and a, and a, a lack of desire to really be seen and heard and to be felt. And, and um, you know, and it took until having like a proper identity crisis to address those issues. And, you know, and this is where I was going. And yeah. even though my wife had been with me throughout all of that, I was, you know, and when my career was going and I was being very productive and I was producing and the business was thriving, I felt like I had value in that it was working mm. and it works until it doesn't. Yeah. When my career, I got to the latter, you know, stages of my skateboarding career and the business, you know, fell apart due to the economic changes in 2008. And, you know, as well as choices that I made that were based on greed and power, mm. those, those things, my world came crashing down. And then I spent about five to seven years feeling loss, feeling um, regret and, and being tortured by my decisions and feeling shame, really, that I'd invested in these things, but not knowing how to fix it, not mm. knowing how to change my world or change my life. And then that led to me, you know, getting further addicted to social media and getting further addicted to cotton candy, we'll call it yeah, anything, yeah. anything that makes me not focus on my pain or my shame or my lack of feeling relevant yeah. right now. Um, you know, and I, I spent a while there and it really started to separate my wife and I, you mm. know, she's, she's telling me the the things of like you know like snap out of it like snap out of it you're you're stuck in chasing these fleeting things but you know i was in such deep denial as anyone is when they're in addiction or they're really trying to escape their pain yeah. i was in such deep denial that i was resentful for the things that she was telling me and i put up barriers and walls in our mm. relationship and you know a few years ago our relationship was at the edge of a cliff yeah and it was like she was telling me that i can no longer go down this road with you like it's lead it's it's headed to nowhere mm. and and i'm no longer you know feeling like we're in this together and our our relationship is not going forward mm. and you know i had i had already experienced a loss a lot of loss with business and i had experienced loss with friendships that were fall out from the business and there was a lot of loss in my life and you know, and now I'm faced with the ultimate worldly loss, which is the, the destruction of our family unit. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it really, really brought me to my knees. And, you know, although I'd been going to church throughout this whole time, I'm listening to the message every Sunday, but it's only permeating my, like my mind and my being like, you mm -hmm. know, the, the top layer, you know, it's yeah. only on the surface. I'm not really letting it penetrate my heart and letting the Holy Spirit inside me come and move me and change me and transform me yeah. because I'm fighting it. I'm, I'm still There's fighting no personal it. relationship where yeah, you are I, being led by his word, his, totally. um, his spirit. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'm still, I'm still, you know, wrestling for my own identity to, mm -hmm. to, for it to be about me. And I realized that that was the biggest problem. And, you know, once again, like I did when I got saved the first time, you know, I had to fall to my knees and mm. ask the Lord to help me. And I really had to change how I, how I participated in life. And I had to change it like tomorrow or today, yeah. like 
you know, and I went and signed up for a, a Bible, you know, a Bible men's group, a Bible study men's group. Um, you know, I went and got it, got into therapy. I, mm. you know, got into a, a 12 step program that was most appropriate for me and just tried to get help, you yeah. know, and really learn how to implement new practices in my life. And for me, it was a program of every yeah. 24, 24 to 48 hours practicing this new thought process and this yeah. new way of this new way of participating. It took me disconnecting from social media for a few months, mm. just completely, you know, acknowledging where I was and, and gradually as I, you know, sobered up from this like addictive, yeah. obsessive, self-indulgent behavior. I started seeing things for as they really were. Just like if you're an alcoholic and you're yeah. abusive to someone, you know, as you get more sober, you start to realize how abusive you've been, mm. you know? And so this is, this is about two years ago. And I started gradually, and, and the crazy thing is, is, you know, I went to my church and I was like, you know, the, um, I was like, hey, I, I wanna sign up for a men's group. And I went to the men's group and the, 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 um, we were going through a, a a book series, a men's book series called Authentic Manhood. And it was like, it was basically a series that told you how to be a man based yeah. on biblical teachings. Yeah. And it was like, it was everything I had never heard. Wow. It was wow. everything I'd never been taught you about, how to, about you how to be never... a man. Well, it wasn't even that I believed it. I'd never yeah. even thought profoundly like that, that this is what it, this is what it means to be a man and show mm -hmm. up for, for, for those that you know you're responsible for and yeah. that you have relationships with you know um and then that was it was that's a it's a yeah i think it's like a six or nine part series and there's these books you watch these videos and you know they break they unpack what it is to be a man authentic manhood is what it's called it's with right now media and if you're if you guys if there's anybody out there that's struggling and, and you want some direction of yeah. of how to be the best version of yourself and you're a man and you're a believer or you're interested in, in this, you know, look up authentic manhood by right now media and it really changed my life. Mm. It gave me the fundamentals of how to be a man. And the crazy thing is, is I'm I'm doing this at 43 years old. You know, I <laughs> These are things that you would you would think you would learn in your early 20s or 25 or something, you know, but maybe people learn this stuff at college or maybe they learn it from mentors that they have, but I didn't have it. I was raised by the streets and I was raised by skateboarding yeah. and I was raised by my peers and, you know, I picked up some things along the way and I learned how to navigate life and make money and mm. put a roof over my head, but I didn't know how to be an authentic man, especially by biblical sense. So this series, I really dug in. I took notes. I took it like it was a college course. Yeah. And, you know, and I showed up every Friday at 630 for this men's group. And I, you know, I, I just immerse myself in it mm. and then, you know, set up a program for recovery and for discovery. Mm. And, and I, I really um, dug in and I, I started going to church and treating every Sunday, like it was a seminar, like it was, it was a lecture Mm -hmm. And and now that I was investing on Fridays in the men's group, when I showed up for Sundays, I was primed and ready to hear the message. My heart was wide open. Yeah. And I started like I started letting the Lord come into my life. <laughs> you sound come, like a you sound like a Christian yeah, who goes come, to church to get fed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Come into my life and really transform me. And those first few weeks were really intense. Like wow. I spent it just in tears going up to the altar for prayer because I was processing the depth of my shame and the depth of how mm. long I had been stuck and how, you know, I wasn't there for my wife and I wasn't there for my friends and my family and my children. Mm. And, and that, there was an immense amount of shame that I had when discovering that. But as I asked for forgiveness and as I let go of that, and as I, you know, the, the, the elders in our church laid hands on me and just hugged me and let me cry in their arms. Like mm. I started release, releasing that. And I no Amen. longer felt I no longer felt burdened by that. And, and gradually, one day, one week at a time, my life started transforming. And mm. my relationships, all my relationships started transforming. <laughs> Even with people I don't like. And <laughs> Hopefully there's and not it, too many of them, but the Bible does say yeah, love your enemies as well. I know. <laughs> I know. And I'm just being honest, you know. And, um, and so that's where I am. I'm about two years down that road. And I am very, very thankful and very grateful for um for this life and for all the relationships i have and to be seeing things the way i do and and my relationship with the lord you know a few years ago even though yeah. i went to church every sunday 
it was at best 10 cans with a bit of string between, mm-hmm. you know, and, and now I check in, I check in daily and, yeah. you know, I do it, I do a devotional, you know, and I, I heard, you know, yours and Richard Mulder's podcast probably over a little over a year ago now. Yeah. And, um, and, and you guys talk about discipline, the discipline of, of connecting with the Lord daily and how yeah. important that was. Maybe it was even Josh Harmony's and, yeah. um, and that, Josh has that a crazy di- story in that. Yeah. 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 And that discipline, I, I got something from that. I got mm-hmm. something from hearing that podcast and I was like, I'm going to be disciplined. I'm going mm-hmm. to focus on discipline. I did it with skateboarding. I have this discipline inside me. I did it with yeah. video parts. I've done it. And now I get to use all the tools that I fostered in skateboarding and in companies mm-hmm in my discovery of my emotional health and, and really focusing on trying to be online. I call being online yeah. is when your physical, your emotional and your spiritual self are in line. Yeah. When those three, when those three things are in line, you can really show up yeah. for people and you can show up to hear people, to see people, to love them and connect mm. with them. And I focus on that emotional sobriety as much as I can, you know, mm. with prayer, devotion, and, and learning and opening myself up to, you know, real conversation. So um, I, I don't even remember if there was a question, but uh, this, this... you started with talking about Joanne. I was going to say, was Joanne at church? Your wife, was she at church when you were there getting prayed? No, getting you know, we, we weren't close enough at the time. We were pretty, so it was that serious. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we were together living in the same house, but it was like, we, there was a great divide between us. And I was mm. taking the kids to church by myself because you know, that divide was pretty large Mm. and, and, you know, and it's, it's by the grace of God that our relationship, you know, one day, one week at a time started changing. Mm. And, you know, it took about six months to a year for our family unit to start being healed and and coming back together, you Mm. know, and now we do it. I was going to say, I do a devotional in the morning myself to on my own. And I, yeah. I pray for, I pray, you know, and one thing is, is this has really helped me a lot too. And I just want to speak about it for a second. Yeah. I, I, pr- I pray, well, first I give thanks. Yeah. And then I pray, <laughs> I pray for my wife, my kids, my family, my friends, and mm. anyone in my sphere that I know is struggling. And, and that, that process of praying for other people it puts other people's needs. So I still haven't prayed for anything myself, for myself. I'm, I'm thanking the Lord for the blessings. I'm thanking the Lord for giving me this opportunity with my wife. This, yep. this, this, um, this ability to connect at such a deeper and more real level. Um, and then when I go and pray for other people, and at the end, I'm, I'm praying for the wisdom to be able and, and the grace to be able to show up for other people. Yeah. But putting other people first is like, if I can start my day there, I, I, I have a different day. It's not about me. It's not about my Instagram. It's not about mm-hmm. someone telling me I'm awesome. It turns into <laughs> how can I serve others? And, and at this point in my life, that's what I want to invest in is how can I, how can I be here mm-hmm. to help someone and help, wow. help, help others? And my wife and I's relationship has absolutely transformed. And, and we are loving each other in such a deeper, more real way than ever before. I see her, I feel her. And when she, you know, when something's, when something's going awry, I'm asking, how, what can I do to help? Yeah. You know, I'm not trying to fix it any longer. It's not my responsibility to fix her feelings, fix her emotions, mm. fix, the, fix the problem. I can own in any missteps that I've, that I've taken. I can apologize for them mm. and I can talk through them, you know, as articulately as I'm capable of in order to try and avoid those things in the future and convince, convey to her that I, I do understand the concerns. Yeah. But, I, but after that, I, I just, how can I help, you know? And, um, yeah, that, that's the Lord. And for those who are listening, I want you to grasp people, folks, you know, what we say over here in the U S now, but Jamie was CEO. I mean, you got CEO of what San Diego or something in like whatever year you're talking about millions of dollars coming in all this stuff. And, and I challenge Jamie sometimes too to say, Hey, though, that's a part of your life. You might not look back on if me and him go out to eat, if we're around someone, if there's a business owner, I'm obviously going to invite Jamie into the conversation because he's lived that realm. But even you saying people could hear this and go, Oh man, all of that coming down is a bad thing. Well, no, it's not. It's a good thing. And your heavenly father got a hold of you and said, son, I want to show you what life's really about. And even you saying in my 40s, Moses didn't know what he was doing until he was 40. He pretty much thought he was the savior for the nation of Israel. 
And Jesus is, you know, Moses was a type of Christ in a sense. But I say this to say, Jamie isn't talking about religiously going to church. I'm not checking in. It's not only a program and a system. It isn't that I get up and read five prayers and do this and do that. Some of you guys with a Catholic background are like, oh, this is what we mean. No, what we mean is the living God who sent his son to die for man, for our shortcomings, for our sin, for our need, where that sometimes people don't want to even hear anymore. And so many people, you know, we could be talking about crude jokes. We could be making fun of people. We could be just tearing apart the president or whoever. And it's funny. It's going to get loads of likes. But you start talking about an invisible God that supposedly deals with Jamie Thomas's heart and helps his marriage and bless them with children and gave you, Jamie, the ability to have the skate career so we can be on a podcast so people can hear today. But ultimately, the biggest picture is that, that God did so love the world that he sent his son, Jesus. And for many in the skate world, we mock this, you know, like even every thrash of video with the 666 in the horns. I get it's like fun. It's culture. Okay, whatever. But there really is a living. And I spent a lot of time with Jake Phelps. Jake Phelps read the Bible. He knows the word of God. You know what I mean? Witnessing the Cardiel, all these guys. I did plenty of that when I first came to faith. They heard. But what Jamie's talking about is coming to himself and God arriving there. You know, the, the living God, uh, forgiving Jamie Thomas, forgiving me, living inside of us through the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, granting us eternal life. We're going to get to be with him forever. But while we're here now, how do you then take these platforms and live for him? And I don't know if you remember, but years ago when I first came to faith, I think we were in Texas. You know, when you first come to faith and for six months, you're like, Greg Laurie, like on steroids, you're just telling everyone. And they even say, you'll tell more people about Jesus the first six months. But we were hanging out then. And I remember you just saying, and you know, I was still a part of skate culture, but it was different. I was like, man, I just, you're like, the company's doing so well. There's so much going on. You know, it's great. This, and you weren't saying a prideful way. You're just saying everything's going as it should be. And you were saying, but I almost feel distant from the Lord. And I remember just thinking, man, and I think I said it, you know, a lot of times the enemy comes in and he offers us the world. You know, when Jesus was filled with the spirit, he was led out into the wilderness. And one of the first things that happened was Satan tempted him and he offered him the world. He offered him this glory. He offered him all these things. And they were the same three things that actually in the garden of Eden, Eve seen in that fruit. We don't know exactly what it was, but she looked at it. The desire was in her. She went for it. She took a bite. So did her husband. And that was it. But I remember even then, and I think Josh Harmony later was like, we had Jamie was telling me like you were bringing up, you know, don't be distracted or something. So for you, you would almost say today, you're going to use the companies, you're going to use the relationships, you know, but or it starts with God, then goes to your wife, then your kids. And this is just who Jamie is. Now you live this out to the world. You're a man of faith. We've got our own journey, but now we want to shine the light of Christ to the world so they can really hear and, and know our, our father in heaven, you know? So. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I remember that in Texas and I remember being, you know, thinking that you were, you were beating my door down and I was like, you know, <laughs> and, and previous to that, you know, we had had a good relationship and friendship yeah. and it wasn't, it wasn't that I was unappreciative. I just felt like you were invading my space. Yeah. Um, and, and it was really probably more so that I didn't want to hear what you were talking about, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I was, I was struggling, you know, and mm -hmm. I, I, unfortunately or fortunately, however you want to look at it. Yeah. I have to learn lessons the hard way, you know, and, mm. um, and it took me a long time to learn my lessons and, mm. you know, and, you know, and I'm, I'm a bit conflicted. I mean, I run a skateboard company and it's not a Christian company. Zero is not a Christian company. Mm. You know, my fingerprints of what represents me, I try and make sure that, that they're in line with my beliefs. Mm. Um, but you know, really, I feel that my, my greatest um, level of influence right now is, is to serve people, you know, and, and I think that that looks different in, in most, you know, environments, yeah. you know, but it's to be consistent, it's to be patient, it's to be loving. And, um, you know, and I, I ask every day to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So I'm, I'm a representative of, of the Lord and, Amen. and I'm, I'm trying to do that and I'm practicing that, <laughs> that life. And you know what it really comes down to, Brian? It yeah. really, and this is metaphorically speaking, I, I spend each day really making an effort to walk in the light, to walk in honesty. And when I say the light, meaning that all around me can see what I'm doing. They mm. can see 
you know, my family, my, my wife knows where I am. She knows what I'm, what my plans are for the day. Yeah. My coworkers know what my plans are. They know what we're doing as a company. Mm. I'm walking in the light in, in hopes that I can, you know, be there to put my arm around someone else and help yeah. someone else in some way, shape or form. And, um, and, and that is a, a very, uh, very different way of living for me. Mm. And, you know, and I have selfish moments. I'm not trying to act like I'm not selfish. You know, I still, from time to time, I, you know, get on Instagram and I'm like, I wonder what the people <laughs> think about me. You know, I, I'm still checking in, you know, and I'm still a product of this world, but I'm really, mm. I'm really fighting that. And I'm really trying to invest in things that are eternal. And I'm trying to invest in relationships because, you know, those relationships, if I can mm. help someone discover or understand why this change has happened in me, Mm -hmm. And I can talk about that or that opens up dialogue about the Lord, the Lord's presence in my life or this, Amen. this, this refocus and this redirection. Um, yeah, that I think that's what the Lord wants me to do. And, you know, and I, I learned a long time ago that I'm, I'm not a preacher. I'm not yeah. an evangelist. You know, I'm, I'm a, a guy that's very passionate about skateboarding and that's passionate about skateboard culture. And, mm. you know, and I'm, I'm very passionate about, relationships now and yeah and i'm trying to invest in those things however i can mm. to be a, to be of service um you know for the kingdom so that essentially i'm i'm very very grateful i'm grateful for this quarantine i get to spend more time with my <laughs> wife and my kids yeah um you know and and i also i find that i thrive in the struggle and right now our business, you know, it's, it's not struggling per se, but we're, we're running out of skateboards because the factories have been closed mm. and, and we're finding a way to be resourceful. And I really, I really like being in the face of adversity. I've, I've, mm. em, I've embraced that as my comfortable place as being yeah. in the struggle. And, and may, I don't know if that's good or bad, but I appreciate it. And um, I feel like if I appreciate the struggle, then everything else is roses. Well, that's what the struggle is, you know. I mean, it began in a garden with a tree and thorns and um, being birthed through a woman, but it was finished also in a garden, the Garden of Gethsemane, um, and it was also to do with a tree, and he wore the crown of thorns, and a woman, a virgin, Mary, gave birth to him. But yeah, in this life, I mean, I, I look to you, and, and I say this as, called, if, as well, you know, I'm with Jeff all the time, Roly, obviously, and he's like, you know, it's just a different generation you guys can ride that out into the sunset and go, Hey, we've had these companies, these sponsors, but I look at you guys as like, you're still doing what you love to do. If guys can still ride pools this way, you're still pioneering brands. You're still doing what you're doing. It just looks different than, you know, going to rink on and almost breaking your ankles every day and see the stage you're in in your life as a believer. I'll tell you. And for those who are listening, there's going to be a lot of people, friends. We all know the amount of people that hit me up that I won't even mention midlife skateboarders who you would think have nothing to do with the Lord, who have question and concern because guys, what do we all have in common? Whether we sound funny like me or funny like Jamie, I mean, our accents, even only, you don't sound like you're from Alabama, by the way, too much nowadays. Yeah, I've been fighting it. <laughs> but what we have in common is that we're human. We're all going to pass one day and life is its struggle. So I applaud you for, you're absolutely right. Zero there's fingerprints there, but your fingerprint is your own expression. You know what I mean? And you have a company, there's things you're doing. People are going to make their choices like me. I typically am an evangelist traveling 200 times a year, doing a lot of ministry. And like you've said, I will never go somewhere to make my kids resent God because I'm so busy. I'm a homebody. I want to be here. I'll fly in, fly out. I study prep sermons right here while my kids are around. You seen Jude a minute ago, but, um, any closing thoughts as well, just like what you would encourage someone that's listening or just, and, and I just want to encourage you, don't look back like all of your life is because it's, we get it. We all appreciate what skating has done for us. You know, the 411 videos became like the Bible to us and that <laughs> generation of trans worlds and, and all the photographers and friends were with and all the rest of it. But moving forward, I mean, we know that better days are ahead as far as where the Lord's leading us. Ephesians 2.10 says, you and me, Jamie, are his workmanship. We're made in his image. He has great things for us to do. And we're going to go deeper with that. But just to encourage people or to look forward for maybe you and whatever it may be, what do you think? Well, there's a few things that you said there. One is, is that I no longer have regret of my past. Mm. I, I no longer have regret of how long I was disconnected from the Lord or disconnected from um, or how long I spent in selfishness. You know, when I, when I first 
you know, redevoted myself to the Lord, I, there was a lot of shame around how long I stayed selfish and how long I, you know, was in lust for power or acknowledgement or accolades. Um, but I, you know, I asked the Lord for forgiveness and I've, I've, I've forgiven myself. And now I'm in sheer gratitude, sheer gratitude and, <laughs> and appreciation, gratitude and appreciation for my past, all of the mm. memories, all of the good times I, I got to experience traveling and learning. And mm. n- now I'm just, you know, and it's kind of foggy because I was, I was emotionally disconnected a lot of that time. So I don't think that I was as present as I could have been. So when I go back and think about the memories, I'm more thinking about the videos and what those memories show because I was so disconnected and so obsessed with whatever the, whatever the mission, whatever the mission was that it's almost like cloudy, you know, Yeah. who got hit, who got kicked out, what was happening that night. Yeah. Yeah. You know, but, but really, um, I'm just so thankful for all, all the experiences and all the, all the people that I've gotten to meet. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, most of all, I'm so thankful that all of that led me to right now, mm-hmm. all of that led me to this, this overwhelming feeling of mm-hmm. gratitude and appreciation for the life I have right now and for the relationships I get to be involved in, you know, and I thank my wife every single day now, like I thank you. <laughs> Thank you for being my friend and giving me a chance mm-hmm. to um, to redeem myself and to invest in you and invest in our family, and um, you know, and I don't I don't have regret about that anymore. I've I've um, I've let that go, and and right now I'm I'm very optimistic for what the future holds because I have a new way of seeing the day and seeing the life and and knowing that the breath I breathe is a gift, and. And, and any connection I get to have with you or anybody else, mm. that is a blessing. And I want to go into that conversation and into that relationship with that mindset. <laughs> and, and I think that the Lord has, you know, like amazing things in store for myself, for my family, for my kids. And, um, and I'm very hopeful about the future. So, um, you know, I want to encourage what I would want to encourage people is if you're struggling and if you're mm-hmm. at a play, if you're at a crossroads, I would encourage you to get help. I would encourage you to reach out to someone who is on solid footing in your world and ask them for help and guidance mm-hmm. because I stayed in pride and ego for a long time acting mm-hmm. like I had everything under control and I thought it was weakness to, sh- to, to need help or to, you know, get therapy. Like I needed to make sense of things and my emotional clarity was not there, Mm. you know? Um, and I, I had, I I've spent the last, you know, I'll just say it. I spent the last two years in recovery, you know, and, and recovery of my old patterns and my old ways and trying to implement new patterns and, you know, exercise in the morning. Now it took my, my wife had been, had been encouraging this for years, exercise in the morning. Now, has been a regimen that I'm on and it changes my day Mm. praying in the morning devotions. So I was telling you earlier, I do devotions personally and then we do devotions as a family and we just say one prayer before our day starts after breakfast or before breakfast. And I think that that connects us as a family. And even if we get into fights or quarrels, there's still, there's still a foundation of connection that we started our day there. And that, Mm. that, that there's this, this understanding that, that the Lord is looking over our lives. And he, and if we, if we reach out to him, he's there for us waiting. And um, I want to teach my kids that. And and if anybody's struggling out there, you know, I encourage you to get help because there's help out there, you know, find a, a Christian therapist or find a therapist, find, go to a church and ask someone in the church or call Brian you yeah, know, call me um, up. Yeah. I mean, I know we're available online. And, and James yeah. is saying being on Instagram is the enemy and it's whatever. He's saying for our culture, we can become obsessed. But I'm just telling you now, Jamie, that you're going to get bombarded with people who are, are, are celebrating the work the Lord has done in you and is doing in you. And we need this, you know, as a community of skateboarders, you've had so many friends pass away, depression, where they're taking their own lives. This is our culture. God had me step back and focus on. For those of you who might not remember my life, but I was married, had a kid, then I was divorced, suicidal, came to faith, witnessed to her, she came to faith. My son's now 19, my two other kids are in the house, my wife's over here, by the grace of God, you know, cooking raw vegan food, she likes to do that. But 
God is good. And the reason you're listening to Jamie Thomas and Brian Sumner today is because of the work of the Lord. So you're hearing a humble man here. And I know, I know we're selfish. For the Apostle Paul to say, wretched man that I am, the things I want to do, I don't do. And the things I don't want to do, I do. Yeah. Let me just release you, Jamie. You're never going to get free of that. For yeah. the rest of our life, we want to make sure the podcast is perfect. Yeah. How's my hair and everything? Yeah. I'm kidding. But that's the flesh. That's part of who we are. But totally. within us, the believer is the spirit of God. So I just want to say, I appreciate your time. Any closing thoughts you want to give or? Last one. Yeah. For anyone that's struggling with addiction or that's mm. struggling with some sort of obsessive behavior that is not serving them or no longer serving you, I want to encourage you to find a 12-step program. Mm. And in that 12-step program, the, the, first, the first and second step is admitting you have a problem and knowing that only a power greater than you can, can, can return you to sanity. And I, mm. I really want to encourage you to, to take that step and find a, find a program, find a meeting, get help or whatever it is that you're struggling with mm -hmm. and and you will see the promises come true in your life and that will be with a, a connection and a relationship with a higher power and my higher power is jesus and the heavenly father mm -hmm. and you know whatever that is for you i really want to encourage you guys to get help if you need it and other than that you know be thankful for this moment and don't wish it to be anything different and guys i'm just gonna say even for jamie you know i know you said you're not a preacher an evangelist but because God has made us a certain way and there is a productivity, you may end up putting this stuff, these, these, these steps and your faith and journey. I could see you helping young men grow and the things they've gone through. You know what I mean? What generation for us as skateboarders, who do they even look to anymore? When yeah. you talked about, you know, was becoming self-obsessed, our kids wake up saying how many likes, how many follows, how many, whatever. It's not all done in vain. We we're, we're bent that way culture yeah. is leading us that way but guys we just want to say that man we, we do love you i appreciate everyone in the skate universe it's been amazing i still stay up to date with stuff i still see what yourself i'm watching the street leagues i seen shane o'neill footage yesterday skating is looking strong but but for us could you just pray us out and just just say something nice about it what, what's going on right now and yeah sure that. thank sure. you all right Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time to connect with Brian and to talk about the struggles that I've faced and he's faced. And mm -hmm. thank you for um, blessing our lives and pointing us in the direction um, of you. And I ask that anyone listening to this and anyone struggling, that they are able to find you and that you're able to meet them where they are yes. and help them with whatever they're going through. I thank you for all the blessings in our lives. And I thank you for this time together. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, guys, this is just a couple of older skateboarders hanging out. I know Jamie's probably fitter, eating better, doing all those exercises. But, you know, I really want to just tell you, it's about God getting to know him. And he blesses us with skateboarding. He allows us to use money. He knows his quarantine. He knows his things going on. A guy coming from Liverpool, England, who'd never even read a Bible. That famous saying, don't put something down if you've never picked it up. Some of you were raised in the church with loving grandparents or parents. Some of you were mad or hurt, hate God. Open up that Bible. See what it says. If it's really about controlling the masses, why don't they put it in school? If it's about controlling us all, why, isn't, why aren't all the world leaders talking about it? It's banned in many countries. But what it is, it's God's love letter to us. You say it was written by man. No, it was recorded by man. Man penned it the same way a man writes an email or sends something. But we're telling you today, that we're praying and believing you begin that relationship with Jesus through repentance by the way he did on the cross. So Jamie, I'm so thankful. I know you're, you've been so, so busy, but I'm glad you've paced yourself. It's been this season. I'm sure you're jumping into some fun things. And the next time I come down there, is it Rico's? Is Rico still going? <laughs> yeah, I don't eat at Rico's anymore, but we'll, we'll find some good food. Jimbo's don't worry about that. Somewhere. Okay. Yeah, don't worry about that. I, I know all the good spots to eat. <laughs> Um, but yeah, man, I, I'm not busy anymore, Brian. I, yeah. I, I focus on, um, on things that matter now and I focus yeah. on slowing down a bit and, um, you know, the, the, um, the abbreviation or whatever for busy is busy yeah. under Satan's yoke. And I, yeah. <laughs> I am not trying to live that life anymore. I'm really trying to, um, to make time for the things that matter. And, um, uh -huh. and you, my friend matter. Thank you for inviting me on the show. I appreciate it. And thank to all, all those listening, thanks for, for, thanks for going on this journey with us. I appreciate it.
Well, guys, closing, the Bible says the message of the cross is foolishness. That's why we named it this. It's foolishness to those that are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. And what that means is we hear this message. Do we know it? Do we hear it? That God so loved the world. So this is Jamie Thomas and Brian Sumner. For more about me, go to briansumner.net. Message us. Hit us up, guys. You do matter. Jamie isn't just saying this. It isn't fluff. It's great to see the journey the Lord's taken him on. I try and make as much time as I can for people, obviously with the same restraints, wife, kids, so on. But God bless you all. Amen. Take care, Brian.